Well, thank you very much. There's a number of friends in the room and I'm glad to see all of you again. I apologise and I'm rather jet lagged. I got in at about uh, two o'clock this morning from New Zealand. So if I fall asleep in this lecture, uh, I'm very sorry. And it does mean that I'll refer to my notes more than I traditionally do. Uh, I think most of us would accept this premise, that governments are more likely to make better decisions when they use well-developed evidence wisely. But not all is well in this nexus between science, broadly defined, society and governance. Science can be ignored, manipulated, or, evenly fa or even falsely constructed for particular ends. The ability for misleading information to become the basis of political and advocacy and strategy is not new. I think it's been around for a long time. What's changed? So I don't think this is a crisis of knowledge or of expertise. What it is is what's changed has been the nature, speed and pervasiveness of communication. There's been little doubt that despite the many benefits of the digital revolution, these change societal, that, that there have been major societal changes because of that revolution. And it's, I think, that revolution that's leading to this big shift in the relationships between citizens, media, elected representatives, interest groups, and experts. And of course, the genie's out of the bottle in that the digital world has a dynamic that appears largely beyond the control of traditional instruments of governance. And I'll return to that in a moment. And with the democratization of information, for all of its transparency and benefits, comes an increasingly widely held view that information alone is enough, that analysis and insight is no longer needed. And as a result, the populist tools of the social media in particular have served to call out the apparent elitism of experts, including sparing no sector in that process, with science being no exception. So what theorists once called our post-trust society now appears to have taken a further step towards what's been called rather trendily the post-truth society, where knowledge is considered irrelevant, irrelevant in the face of personal beliefs. I'm not entirely comfortable with this term or with its generalizability, but it's become a shorthand which I cannot but help use, nor does everybody else. It's self-evident, as I said before, that virtually every challenge a government faces has a scientific dimension. The issue becomes whether robust science is available and is well used, misused, manipulated or ignored. So the issue is complex. On the one hand is the challenge, as I've just mentioned, of the populists, of populist politics in the media and the tendency to equate experts with elites and then vilify them. And then parenthetically, I think we should be honest and think about the reasons why societal, economic and cultural things have happened which have allowed this set of uh, attitudes to be exposed. And on the other hand, the scientific community is not without repro beyond reproach. Scientist, science can get easily caught up in an elitist framing, particularly when we're arrogant, because we must admit that science cannot solve every problem, nor can we claim that it does, nor can we claim that we know better than politicians how to solve the problems of the world. We've seen many examples of scientists ex uh, expressing considerable hubris and arrogance in trying to say they know what to do and ignoring the many other dimensions of addressing a problem, many complex problems, and going to return to this time and time again. And of course, science is not the only input into policy making. When I started in this role in 2009, 
I used to use the term evidence-based policy making. Sorry, that shouldn't say policy-based policy making. There's my jet lag at work. It should say evidence-based policy making. I don't like this term evidence-based policy making. The words are loaded and not helpful. I tend now to talk about policy making being informed by scientific evidence. Now, this may seem like a semantic difference, but I think it's really important. Evidence to the non-scientist means far much more than science. It might come from tradition, prior belief, particularly religious belief, anecdote and observation, which particularly for the politician are by far the biggest forms of evidence, whereas scientific evidence, we would argue, has a different basis, and that's what gives it any, any claim to privilege. But the assumption that then follows from scientists is, is that scientifically derived evidence capable and should it inform and determine policy? In reality, policy making and the science supporting it are far more complex than saying that the evidence shows that intervention A reduces outcome B and therefore the government must invest in intervention A. Let's parse this further. First, what is the evidence that intervention A works? Is it based on one trial or just on normative argument? Is it based in context that matter or is it just because it works somewhere, it will, work, will it work here and with this population? Is it a scalable intervention? What's its effect size? What's the evidence compared to alternate strategies? What is the counterfactual? These are all scientific questions which the scientific community can give input to. But then there's a whole raft of additional non-scientific questions which are values-based, which need to be asked. What's the cost? What's the risks associated with intervention A? And who are those risks to? What are the trade-offs? Is P, B even a priority in the minds of the public or the politician? The point being obvious, that the decisions about whether to implement an intervention are not as, as simple as saying, I as a scientist know from one study that intervention A affects outcome B. This evidence-based policy language has echoes of Robin Merton's description of science when he said in 1942 that scientists stand apart from society and inform it. Hopefully we're well past that somewhat, I don't know, uh, religious view or priesthood view of science. As I say, I don't think we can ever claim that science makes policy, which is why I don't like the word evidence-based. I think what we say is science can inform policy, and we, f we forget that at our peril. In this recent book, by P uh, The Politics of Evidence-Based Policymaking, which despite its title is a great book, Paul Kenny makes an important insight. Scientists in general are very good at problem definition, but not so good at finding workable, scalable, and meaningful, at least in the political context, solutions. Be it climate change or obesity, this is a real challenge. Moving from the tightly controlled interventions that might be done in, say, a randomised controlled trial to a real-world solution that will work in a complex context. And in part, it's because the kind of science that leads to problem definition is very different to the kind that's needed to respond. Problem definition often only involves a limited number of disciplines. Climate change defini definition only required climate scientists. But the solution involves behavioural scientists, economic scientists, many technologies, many other forms of science, and therefore engages a totally different range of stakeholders than those that tend to be involved in the definition. And that's what creates the complexity. There's been a growing interest in whether one can take the experience of evidence-based medicine and apply it to what's been called, and I don't want to call it that, evidence-based policy. <laughs> 
I think this is a dangerous analogy, as Justin Pankhurst, ma Parkhurst makes very clear in his recent book, The, the, the Politics of Evidence, in that, again, evidence-based medicine is based around particularly good and in interventional science based on randomised controlled trials, but becomes much more limited in its applicability when you even go to preventative he public health, where the situation becomes much more dynamic. And I think what we're seeing in evidence-based policy making uh, in the areas like what works units and behavioural insights units is that it's very good at dealing with narrow, specific, person oriented interventions, but it's not very helpful when one's looking at the macro level. Equally, on the other hand, we're also seeing on the side a, a massive in interest and increase in the use of big data and analytics and policy formation. Now, there's obviously enormous potential here, but there are many traps in establishing causality <coughs> and many cha challenges to be worked through at every step in the policy process involving big data. And indeed, my office is currently preparing a report on exactly this topic. It's certainly not a question of promoting blind faith in data. It needs interpretive expertise. So even if we could simply wave the baton of science at the problem, there's then the issue of how and where to apply it in the policy process. Now, this is the common diagram you find in every textbook about a policy cycle. The only problem is it's a total mythology. Policy making never occurs like that. It's a much more complex, messy process, which I've tried to simplify up here. It's a very messy process involving multiple actors, coalitions of actors, both informal and formal, elected and non-elected. And the issue is where and how the science or scientific evidence fit into that process. Policy makers, like all of us, have limited bandwidth and often surprisingly limited manoeuvrability just simply because of the context in which they're operating. They often lurch to problems driven by the exigencies of external influences, the ballot box, media, emerging information, and so forth. To be sure, there are policies that emerge slowly over time and with deliberation and may be somewhat closer to the idealised cycle. But these always get submerged by the acute events that arise. And the changed nature of the media cycle and the impact of social media is making that longer term focus harder and harder for governments all around the world to cope with. Because of this, these factors, complete and established knowledge is never there at the time that policy makers need it. Instead, the available knowledge is generally incomplete and often ambiguous incomplete and ambiguous. Yet for the policy maker, decisions are urgent regardless of the state of knowledge. Policy makers live with uncertainty and ambiguity in every decision they make. In contrast, the science community often feels unable to go beyond the mantra of more research is needed. In other words, give me more money. We cannot, in the face of complex science, expect policy makers to be scientific referees or to translate directly from scientific language to action. And I could give you all sorts of stories of how I've had to take on a role in emergencies such as earthquakes of translating between the seismological community and the policy community, particularly about understanding absolute and relative risk. In other words, what I'm really saying is there needs to be an interface between the science community and the policy community, one that is involved in both translation and brokerage. Scientists, especially in the brokerage role, need to recognise that in a democracy, policy makers have the right to ignore, but hopefully not to deny, the evidence. Even if, in my view, it's unwise and, un and ultimately counterproductive to do so. 
But the reasons they might ignore the evidence might involve many values-based considerations that scientific knowledge could inform but cannot resolve. Political ideology, electoral contracts, public opinion, fiscal consequences, diplomatic consequences, etc., etc., etc. The nature of democracy means that there are always multiple trade offs in play in every decision a government makes, and different stakeholders have very different perspectives. So, is scientific advice of any value at all? If experts in a troubled post-trust and post-truth world are marginalised as elites, and if they can't solve our problems anyhow, do they have any value? In my opinion, scientific advice in this context is more important than ever. However, scientists, advisors and advisory structures will need to be, have a particular sensitivity in how they provide advice and evidence in this context. They need to be sensitive to this complex entanglement of different players I've shown there on the left in that figure. And I think one of the things we need to recognise is the nature of this entanglement between science, policy and society is changing. And that's what I want to comment on next. So let's start with the changing nature of science in this interface. The first challenge is there's too much science. Last year, three million scientific papers of variable quality in 30,000 journals of very variable quality. What's driven this massive expansion? It's been driven by the expansion of tertiary education, which is a good thing, and the bibliometric disease which has replaced proper performance assessment of scientists in many research institutions. Many of the papers produced have minimal impact beyond that of the author's CV. And somehow governments and policy makers have to work through that morass to separate the reliable from unreliable science. Issues of reproducibility, quality and interpretation abound. Second, the nature of science itself has changed. Computational changes have advanced, have changed the nature of the questions that can be asked and allow for a lot more non-linear analysis than, say, 50 years ago. So, uh, the explosion of the life sciences is another factor. And between these things, we're seeing a much greater focus of science on systems social, environmental, ecological and human systems than in the past. And of course, because of this, systems shift to a systems-like thinking. Science is now dealing with policy-relevant questions where the decisions are urgent, the values are in dispute, and there will always remain many scientific unknowns. This is the realm of what Rawitz and Futovitz called post-normal science. And it's where the knowledge brokerage between science and the policy community is most needed. It's in the ecological spaces, the environmental spaces, the human spaces, the social spaces, that the most complex issues of science and policy making occur. But this post-normal post nature of science itself invites mischief and misuse because it can be cherry-picked because of the inevitable invariability in scientific results. Scientific uncertainties can be inappropriately exploited, and these can be injected into complex societal debates. We've seen many values debates obscured by inappropriate co-option of science to be used to avoid debating the values debates. We've seen that in climate change, where there wasn't really a lot of debate over anthropogenic climate change for a long time, but there were awkward economic debates to be had. We're seeing it over the safety of genetically modified foods and so forth. And I think this issue of science being misused as a proxy for societal values-based debates is very bad. I think it shortchanges democracy. Fourthly, we cannot ignore the fact that there's been a far greater utilitarian positioning of science. Governments have, that's why governments invested more and more in science, because they want something for their money. 
and they are the representative of the taxpayer, and I'll come back to the expectations that the taxpayer has on the science community as a result. Different stakeholders in science also have very different expectations and wants. NGOs, advocacy groups, philanthropy, philanthropic foundations, and of course the private sector are also major investors in science and technology alongside the public sector. Indeed, in some sectors they have become the dominant funders. And these changes to the funding of science also create new tensions and the real and perceived conflicts of interest must be addressed to maintain the integrity and credibility of science. And I think that's not easy when you consider this change funding arrangement. Some theorists of post-normal science, and I happen to agree with them, suggest that the concepts of knowledge co-design and co-production must now become inherent in the scientific process to better ensure that the science is done is trustworthy and in the interests of society. The debate within the scientific community that followed the recent publication of Dan Sarovitz's paper in the New Republic shows the many differences in opinion as to mission-led science, that is society-led science, if you turn it in other words, fosters or inhibits intellectual inquiry. This latter point is not metaphysical because it has major implications for how the funding of research should be organised. And as we've seen, and I'm here to chair a view of CIHR, any shift in funding models inevitably leads to reaction within the scientific community. This is going to be a hard set of issues. And although there are these tensions within the scientific system itself, it's their impact on the interface with the rest of society that we should focus on. This relationship is, result, is um, evolving because as a direct result of the world we now inhabit. And as I wrote about in this recent paper, which is on the web, the internet is obviously a double-edged sword. The manifest benefits to our network culture and economy are enormous. It's enabled a much expanded interface between science and society. However, it's also responsible for some of the most troubling trends at that interface. Increasingly, issues are, are being identified from the loss of the authority of the nation state, as we're seeing in the debate over the taxation of the multinational platform companies, to the issues around the loss of personal privacy and autonomy, to impacts on social structures, who we network with, who we talk to, and how we talk to them, if we use our mouth at all, and perhaps even altered brain development. The interconnectivity of our world and the changed way individuals and institutions interact puts a lot of power and responsibility onto the digital platforms providers that increasingly operate beyond traditional jurisdictional control. And this has been accompanied by general decline in the state and the objective role of the fourth estate, the conventional media. Increasingly, our news sources provide us with filtered information matched to our biases. Twitter has promoted the rise of ad hominem attack rather than a healthy debate of ideas, not to mention it becoming an echo chamber. We only hear views from people who already agree with our preceding biases. And to be sure, the internet has greatly increased the access to information, but that information is increasingly unmediated and thus both reliable and unreliable information can receive equal weighting and erroneous information can do come to dominate. And this has created an unprecedented platform for interest groups, some of which can be very sophisticated, yet promote very false ideas. And as we know, once projected, misleading information can become very difficult to erase. Misleading memes such as the false link between autism and measles vaccination become virtually impossible to eradicate. And we've seen how this kind of environment is impacting on the political process. In a sense, as I said at the beginning of this talk, there's nothing new in this. All said and done, uh, the margarine industry, the dairy industry manipulated the truth about the margarine industry 
150 years ago. We've seen how tobacco companies manipulated the situation over the last 50 or 60 years. All that's happened has become a much easier, much more overt, much more pervasive and much more rapid. But to any information, people apply their inherent confirmation biases. And there's now considerable evidence to suggest that just pushing more knowledge at people does not change their minds. It actually drives a wedge further between those of divergent viewpoints. And this is one of the challenges for the science advisory mechanism. Central to all of this is the notion of risk. And as has already been said in the introduction to this session, risk has different meanings to different stakeholders. Scientists and actuaries may talk in quantitative terms, often with a pseudo-precision that masks large uncertainties. But to most people, in fact all people, assess risk through their personal prisms, the role, the various cognitive biases that affect how they perceive cost and benefit, and thus how they perceive risk. In turn, this means that the same data gets interpreted by different people in different ways, and that's why it is, and with it, you then add the echo chamber of the digital world on top of this, and you start to see how you just reinforce views by just pushing more information at people. Individuals have different ways and different values that, that determine how they see the world, each other, and the place within the world. Societies too have very different collective values and most nations are now a much more complex heterogeneity of cultures and subcultures which will influence the values culture within the society. How these risk groups perceive risk varies enormously and impacts on the political discourse. But of course, politicians have a different me definition of risk to everybody else. It's called, will they have a job in three years time? Recently, there was a, uh, I'll just put this up here for a little bit of light relief, but this is in Calestis Juma's uh, recent book on innovation, where he just highlights this point somewhat um, jokingly about how different societies perceive risk and precaution. And I see Canada gets a mention uh, in this particular statement, but the point it makes is they're very different cultural views and societal views on these issues and we as science advisors need to be sensitive to these issues. So how in this context uh, can we enhance the uptake of scientifically developed knowledge into public policy? How can this be achieved given these challenges that I've talked about? The first step I think is to acknowledge the complex of this task and the very complex interaction between science and society, science and policy, policy and society. Yes, the cultures of policy making and science are distinct, the drivers are distinct, the goals and, and roles are distinct, but the interface between these two different cultures are so nuanced and so important that it's now unrealistic to see it left to just ad hoc interactions between policy makers and the scientific community. The post-truth uh, dynamic makes this even more so, and appropriately skilled evidence brokers are needed at this interface. And given the complexity of this interface, multiple structures and multiple forms of brokerage will be needed. So what do I mean by brokerage? I, tr I, trans I distinguish it from advocacy because the point of brokerage is to be a translator and interpreter. Brokerage is about ensuring that the right and appropriate questions asked and answered to the pos extent possible. It's about, uh, it's, about, um, it's about what the science can tell us, what we can be reasonably certain about, what are the gaps in our knowledge, and what are the implications of what we know and what we don't know. What Heather Douglas talks about is the inferential gap. It's about the caveats that might be placed on our knowledge synthesis. It's about the policy options that then emerge and the scientific implications of each. It can highlight the spillover costs and benefits of each option. It can indicate the policy implications of each 
but it cannot resolve those. It's for the policy maker to resolve between the options. The goal of brokerage is to enable more effective decision making, but not to make the decisions. Now, there's no unitary model of effective brokerage. It has multiple dimensions. It must be able to deal with the instant input in emergency on one hand, and assist with horizon scanning and technology assessment on the other. It must be able to arise above the cacophony of competing claims and social media trends. And as will be obvious in the way I frame this talk, it's not just about talking between the science community and the policy community, but also is intimately dependent on effective science societal interactions. Now, I think there's a growing consensus that two basic kinds of brokerage are definitely needed. First is there needs to be those who are close enough to the executive branch who can have that informal and repeated input at multiple points within the policy process. These individuals or structures can show where science can help and can act as interpreters when needed. There are conduits when needed between the science community and the policy community and can look to, and can look to where the integrity of scientific input needs to be protected and protected and protected. And this is the primary role of science advisors or advisory mechanisms, either in ministries or reporting to the Prime Minister or President. And importantly, the success of these roles depends entirely on maintaining the trust and respect of the executive, the policy community, the public and the scientific community simultaneously. The executive, the policy community, the public and the scientific community simultaneously. That's not an easy ask. It's not an easy job, and it requires a particular form of professionalism to achieve it. The second kind of brokerage of a more technical and more deliberative nature comes from the broader academy, either through expert committees or the National Academy or professional organisations. The principles of academic integrity and independence must protect the deliberations of such groups. But they are limited in what they can achieve because they are external to the process. They can probably only interact at one point. They can't ensure the integrity of their viewpoint is held through the process. And to increase their potential impact on the policy development, Academies must learn how to meet the need of the policy community in structuring their work, in orientating their work, and thinking about how they present it. Too often, I think, academy reports are there to show off the academy and the independence and the intellectual depth, rather than to address the issues and the questions that might be relevant to the policy maker. And part of the problem is they tend to come in, they come to be late into the policy process. And that's why I think having a closer relationship between those who are internal to the system, like science advisors, and the academies or their equivalent is so important. So, for instance, in New Zealand, I have the president of the Royal Society of New Zealand come to my meeting of, of science advisors every month so they, so they can hear and learn where the issues lie. Scientists within ministries and agencies also have critical, important roles, and I know this has been a major issue in Canada. Meeting the need for appropriate and more transparent protocols for the access to their knowledge by the public is an ongoing challenge, and there are complicated constitutional issues around this, and they vary across countries. But I think around the world we need to work harder so that that body of knowledge is more accessible in appropriate ways in the process. The goal, whether you're internal or external to the system, must be to show where science can help, to ensure that the appropriate and justifiable questions are answered, to separate good science from bad, to distill the overwhelming amount of information and to interpret confusing claims without alienating the audience and to protect trust in the system, in the scientific system and its processes. 
The issue is how we, can we recast this perception of the expert not as an authoritarian elite, which is what Merton described it as in 1942, into a knowledge of, but into something which is more democratically appropriate, namely as a knowledgeable voice with something valuable to contribute, but not to claim we know everything. The third factor is broadening the understanding of scientists. As scientists, we've been trained largely in 20th century models of universities, and most of us are ill-equipped to deal with the 21st century demands. So this, we must learn to be more practical, but more um, proactive, and understanding issues of policy relevance, to use the tools of modern communication better, and to do so with a particular responsibility which many scientists, particularly when acting as individuals, don't think about. In my view, all professional scientists, and we could debate the word professional, need a more critical understanding of the place of science in society. They need a solid grounding in some concepts of science technology uh, studies, and they need to understand the context of the application of their work, and not as a minor add-on, but as a fundamental part of how they undertake scientific practice. And I think this has profound implications for doctoral and postdoctoral training. I think having scientists trained in these narrow disciplines of molecular biology or physics, as opposed to in the broader context of where science fits into society, it's critical to address, and I think universities around the world need to think about this with urgency. There are some great examples of emerging scientists who can be both outstanding scientists and be deeply interested in this interface with policy and who are seemingly, seemingly intertwining science, rigorous science, with an interest in the policy space. For interest members of the Youth Academy, such as the Global Youth uh, Academy, I see Reese is here, Carsons is here, and structures such as the Science Policy Exchange in Montreal, Paul DeFore is here, are the kind of structures that demonstrate how scientists can have one foot in the policy world without losing credibility as scientists. I think Another factor, just parenthetically, which I'll just mention, is the role of the science media centres. I think the science media centres in those countries which have them have been a great resource to better equip scientists to dampen the flames of post truthisms and I would like to see them expanded more globally. A fourth step, which I've mentioned already, is pointed to in the work of scholars such as Rawitz, Funtovitz and Jasanoff, who highlight the importance of co-design and co-production in building trust between the science community and society. These words have an evolving meaning, but they highlight the need for greater transparency between, within the processes of science. True engagement will be hard and challenging. What does it mean to involve non-scientists in peer review and science governance? And I think this will lead to fundamental shifts much greater fundamental sh shifts in the structure of the scientific apparatus than most scientists recognise at the present time. A final step, or a fifth step, which some have erroneously seen as, this, as an issue of societal deficit and therefore as being the only necessary step, and, I do, and it's far more complex than that, is to improve general scientific literacy and critical thinking. Among the most promising approaches here is, I think, citizen science. Done well, it's neither the exploitation of free data or free labour or action-orientated research. Instead, it occupies a space in which can gauge citizens on questions relevant to them while also imparting a scientist's inherent scepticism and meticulousness of process. And some early evidence suggests it's an understanding of the processes of science that becomes the best defence against post-truthism, rather than to trying to treat it as a knowledge deficit. The strategies I've outlined here are diverse, 
in their approach and in the audiences, but they share a common goal, developing and maintaining trust in scientifically derived knowledge. Simplistically effective knowledge brokerage requires different dimensions of trust. The four different dimensions of trust I've already alluded to, but repair, repeating and repeating and repeating. Maintaining the trust of the politician, maintaining the trust of the policy community, maintaining the trust of the public through the media, and maintaining the trust of the scientific community. Maintaining this equilibrium is not easy, and that's what necessitates a ecosystem of brokers, those internal to the system, those external to the system, those more involved in the informal discourse with the policy and the political community, those more involved in more deliberative discourse uh, and advice. Finally, as has been mentioned, I chair the International Network of Government Science Advice. And we've been working with ICSU, UNESCO and the World Science Forum towards developing a set of operating principles and guidelines that might help in this regard. Uh, this is being led by James Wilson and Dan Sarovitz, and it's ongoing, but I particularly acknowledge Mark Sarna, who's somewhere in the audience, uh, who's playing a major role in this work as well. Any underlying principles must relate ultimately to these issues of integrity advice, trustworthiness, and maintaining this principle of brokerage rather than advocacy. Done well, inclusively, and across national boundaries, scientific advice can hopefully play a productive and constructive role in an increasingly complex, troubled, and changing world. It is a voice of, I think, uh, well-reflected knowledge that is critical in every part of government. And despite the difficulties, I think if we use the approaches I've talked about here, we can resist some of the silliness that's developing at the present time. Thank you very much.